Everyone's got their own secret sauce when it comes to tuning your sound system today. You got to use these reference tracks, have these fancy microphones, and maybe hit this specific target curve for any system to sound right. All of these are great tactics and are attached to meaningful principles that are grounded in physics and trigonometry. There is still a whole lot of voodoo and hearsay when it comes to sound system tuning. I was stuck several years ago when, when I was really diving into this and, and confused by what was being said on forums, what I saw other engineers doing, and what was actually fact from, from fiction. What was someone's preferences versus what is actually proven to get you results? And so I'm not here to say that my way is the best way and what I learned is all encompassing, but I am, I am here to share seven mistakes that I've made in the past and ways to not tune a sound system and other uh, other tactics that I've seen engineer use that, that, that don't work, that will not get you anywhere when it comes to getting meaningful sounds out of your sound system. Uh, so my name is Michael, and I really love helping people level up their audio skills and career by bettering their craft. And today we're going to do just that. I want you to avoid these seven potholes that I've made that have had me get less than perfect results on shows that, you know, I've been deploying $200,000 rigs and made some of these mistakes. And uh, they're costly. You're, you're, you're having to struggle to hear what's going on. You, you feel you're second guessing yourself because you don't have a proven process. So I want to help separate some of those things that you may be seen or heard that might be helpful that are not not going to get you anywhere in the field. We're going to be talking about why EQ is your least powerful tool when it comes to sound system tuning, how to use your reference track the right way, and more importantly, when you should start using them in the sound system tuning flow, why front of house is not the holy grail when it comes to your anal audio analyzer measurements, and what target curves are for and how to hit them, and when to abandon them, okay? So before we jump in today, I've, I've got a gift for you, is my Audio Math Survival Spreadsheet. It is a super nerdy Google Sheet that I've got here for you that has a ton of great calculations for you for your sound system design adventures. So this is helpful when you're planning, when you're in the field to verify results. One that I used just the other day that is super helpful is the Front Fill Calculator. And I'm going to find it again here. Yeah, so it's the front fill or uncoupled array spacing here on row 82. This is something I learned from Bob McCarthy, took from his book and stuffed it in here. There's also the uncoupled array calculator by Daniel Lundberg, which is a standalone app you can run, but I've got a simplified version here for you. This spreadsheet's available at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit, or is at the link below. Please make sure and snag that. Okay, so let's jump into our main segment, seven ways to not tune a sound system. Okay. So number one is to go into a show without a plan. So I, I've done this all too often of knowing the basic outline of what gears on the truck, the console I have, I'm planning my console file and making sure all my inputs are good, but we seem to all neglect outputs. It's a lot more fun to figure out uh, what type of compressor we're going to use on the bottom snare, but not to, to take the time to make the plan and know what we're doing with the speaker layout. So every manufacturer these days has software that's almost all of them are free that you can download and start to play with and familiarize yourself. I understand a lot, a lot of you folks I'm talking to you are freelancers. So many times it's the production company's job to put together a system design plan, give it to you, and you may be the one implementing it in the field. But many times you're not. They're leaning on you to go into a breakout room or even a larger show and say, hey, here's what we got. It is up to you to design it. So having a plan, no matter how small the rig is, 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 is really helpful for a lot of reasons because you can sleep better knowing that you have some reason to, to expect what's going to happen the next day. You're not having to make it up on the fly. And I'm a person that enjoys doing stuff on the fly, but uh, I've had to train myself to, to know what I'm doing ahead of time. So I could spend so much more of my energy doing the, the people skill stuff that matters, not just the technical stuff in my brain. So I just become this zombie that's uh, concerned with ones and zeros. Meanwhile, I haven't met or introduced myself to the band. So uh, one time I was on a political tour uh, leading up to the 2020 campaign with one of the potential candidates. And I did just have to show up in a random city, know that a truck was coming with a set of speakers, who knows what it was, and make it happen. So you can work on the fly, but this requires working on principles uh, and, and being able to basically do a design on the fly in your head as you go. But if you know what's going to be on the truck, you know the room size, the audience size, you can gather all this data and make a plan. So make sure and do that. Uh, I'm going to have a lot more videos coming down the, the pipe on how to do that, what data together, what's doing it. But number one is have a plan. Sometimes engineers just walk in and be like, okay, uh, and they start to panic and throw stuff everywhere. So have a plan. Uh, the inverse of that is number two, relying too heavily on a plan. 
so this is having what I call, and, and something that's been popping up a lot and been chewing on a lot, is having a fragile workflow. So uh, fragile workflows and its in, inverse anti-fragility as a core principle, it's really good to have, is having a, something that has not met the real world or been tested or refined by actual real world processes. And so this is me. When I first started really diving into the stuff, it was fun to get super nerdy and have every sur- uh, single detail ironed out. Yeah, I knew exactly what speakers I had, their coverage patterns, uh, the trim height down to the inch, their, their tilt angles down to a tenth of a degree. Uh, I had a plan for like, okay, what if I couldn't put delays where to put them? And if I had delays, where were they going to be? And what was the estimated alignment time? And this is all to a certain degree, great to have ironed out in your head in the beginning so you can have this embedded in your psyche and know what's going on. Uh, but for every single show you're on, especially if you're having to hop around to do a lot of different ones, it's 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 inefficient and impractical to have all the time. And it because the thing is, uh, I think it's Mike Tyson said that everyone has a plan until you get punched in the mouth. Uh, just like that that political tour I did, uh, if you if I showed up, even knowing it was on that truck, more often times I, I would get in the room and uh, the event manager would be like, hey, we're going to have to flip the room 90 degrees. You can't put speakers here, here, and here because of our camera shot. We have to put a giant American flag here. And all of a sudden, my, my, three, my first three priority spots for putting speakers were knocked out. So then I have to get really creative and put speakers in weird places uh, to make sure that the audience was covered and they could hear and I wouldn't get feedback. Uh, and so having these principles embedded with you to be able to be flexible on the fly with a generic framework of a plan is a great place to be. And it's not just the system design that needs a plan, but having a tuning roadmap uh, because tuning is what we're talking about today. So uh, it, being able to say, hey, I, I know by priority that if time gets short, here are the biggest ticket items I got to figure out. I have to make sure my main systems are sounding the best since they're covering the most amount of people. I have one set of delays and I have to align them so we're not getting this doubling effect. And I know these speakers are reasonably flat out the box, so I'm not even going to worry about EQing them until I hear something because I think they're, I know that these speakers are going to sound great and not have any sort of weird anomalies going on. So this comes from experience, working with lots of different types of environments and fields, and you'll get a feel for what is the right amount of planning versus over planning. But it's good to have these fundamentals embedded in you before, before you jump in and, and do too much beforehand and have wasted time and effort. Okay, number three, how to not tune a sound system is blast your favorite tune at 160 dB and use a graphic EQ and hack it to death. I only say this because I saw it happen two months ago with a big, a very big name act that was touring through some place that was at the venue I was at, but I was on a different part of the show. So I was standing there and they pop up their console. They blast some, the, the, the act wasn't even hip hop, but he just blasts hip hop at an incredibly loud volume, just paces the room back and forth, goes back to his console, adjusts a graphic EQ, you know, just takes up from some 500 Hertz and walks around, takes out some 3k and goes. So this, this is not right in that you got no data with any microphones. You, you, this person did not even ask the engineer or look at their plan or ask what they were hearing in the room. There were just a band plugging into the current A1's rig. So there was no conversation about what are you hearing? What's going on? They just blasted the track, walked around and made some graphic EQ adjustments. I have done just this before, maybe not quite at 160 B, but, uh, and so this is not the, this is the pot calling the, the kettle black to a certain extent, but, uh, this tricks your ears and they're, they're, they're lulled to sleep after about 10 seconds of listening to the same track in the same room. You get used to what, what's going on. This is how we can tolerate some radio broadcasts that are squashed to death and are super bright is that our ears adjust. We get used to it. And, and so being able to have multiple reference tracks in a situation like this when you cannot or don't have time for getting out tuning gear is really helpful. So th- this guy only listened to one, maybe two tracks. So having a list of 10 in an environment when you have to change something that, and, and, and shock your ears out of getting used to it, uh, it is really useful. And so that's why I usually use eight or 10 if I have time and not just rely on the same one every time. I got my three big ones that I use all the time. I've got another great video on that. Uh, one of them is Phoenix by Andrew Holmes. I'd really check that one out. It's my number one system tuning track. 
And it's fantastic. So uh, make sure and ask your production manager when a great time is to tune, because uh, sometimes lighting needs to communicate while they're focusing rigs, or you uh, just don't want to annoy people with blasting pink noise and your reference tracks all the time. So a lot of times it ends up being over lunch when people are quiet anyway. So maybe you get to get lunch first and then tune while people are out of the room. So just have a conversation with your PM and make sure that is going on. Number four is use... Uh, uh, how to not tune a sound system is using a single channel RTA. So what does that look like? So I've got open sound meter open here and I've got the, the same trace that I took at a recent, ri uh, a recent show that I did. I've got the magnitude response and the RTA. So a magnitude response compares two things. You have a measurement channel and a reference channel. So the measurement channel is my uh, microphone that is out in the room. And I apologize if you hear my one-year-old daughter screaming in the background. Um, so it is that microphone out in the room and it's a flat microphone. So it's going to be uncolored and it's going to give me on a graph what's what's going on or give me other data to use in different types of graph. Um, so that's the measurement itself. Then the reference is the, the pink noise I was using to run through the system coming directly out of the audio interface and back into it as a... Again, just as that, as a reference. And so any difference that's happening in the rig, whether an EQ at the console or way the speaker's reacting or the room is going to show up in these graphs. So one thing you can notice right off the bat between the two is that there's some of these parts of the line um, on the magnitude response are empty. So it's not filled in. So what that means is if we pull up our coherence, is that it was very low coherence right there. So that means we do not have... Uh, Again, coherence meaning are these two things the same? So they're very not the same, the measurement and the reference. That means we have bad data. So it's being corrupted probably by the room. And so we can know that, hey, any sort of huge peak or huge dip in the frequency response is due to bad data, not because um, it has some sort of something wrong with the speaker. It could be a floor bounce and we can look at that. So if we look at the impulse response, um, I'm seeing a bounce right here three milliseconds later. This was the original signal. And so we can look at other types of graph that gives this this type of data to know, hey, um, it has a measurement and a reference. We're comparing the two. And these are all different ways to see the differences. This is an RTA. And so this a lot of people use in live mode. Or even if you're mixing in the studio, people use an RTA and look at the peaks and valleys there to determine if a mix, uh, a mix is sounding good. So on the service, this looks really similar to our magnitude response, but it doesn't give us any of this other data. We can't look and see, hey, how similar is this to our pure signal? It can't tell us any timing offsets between our measurement and our reference to help us get alignment between two speakers. And, and, and so although it's a helpful tool, it is the wrong tool for this job of assessing frequency response of a system while you're tuning for assessing phase response. We didn't even get there because it can't tell you uh, phase or what is the relative um, alignment in the total signal versus the original. So we have the top end arriving on time and then the low end starts to drift late. And even then it's blanking out because we don't have the best data. This microphone was very far back in the room and so which is hard to get great data. Anyway, all that being said, a single channel RTA is great for while you're in the field, listening actively in the show for seeing the frequency response in any peaks and valleys is not good for tuning because you cannot compare two things. All right. Number five, oh, how to not tune a sound system is over indexing, over indexing at front of house. It's intuitive to think that we should be uh, prioritizing front of house because the mix engineer, she is at our console. She is listening to the mix and making decisions for everyone in the room. So I'm not saying that you should not take into account data from that point, but oftentimes we're spending too much time putting a microphone there, making sure it sounds great there and neglecting the rest. On larger systems, we're rolling on mains, sometimes under balconies, side fills, front fills, and these are all parts of the system that need to be integrated into the whole. So I would say start uh, with Bob McCarthy's Papa Bear, Mama Bear, Baby Bear approach of make sure the mains are good, um, everything else under that in size is aligned and good and EQ'd, and then stick a microphone in the middle of the middle of one of those zones, so your main zones, and then one in front of house, and then compare the two. Are they similar in level? Are they similar tonally? Are they similar in phase response? And if you're getting similarities there, then you're in good shape. 
Sometimes you're out of control uh, or you do not have control over where front of house goes. A lot of corporate shows that I'm on, aesthetic is more important than what the A1 can hear. So we're shoved in a corner, which oftentimes is out of coverage. You want to prioritize your speakers beyond the audience, the people at the dinner gala or whatever, or the corporate presentation. So make sure that uh, you prioritize the audience and it makes zero sense to put an RTA microphone to actually change how the speakers are sounding in the corner of the room where no one else, no one else is listening. So a front of house happens to be a great representative of the majority of the audience, way heavily there. Always take into account data and pass it there, but don't um, over-index on it and, and make it the king of everything all the time. Okay, number six, how to not tune a SaaS system is using your target curve as gospel. So if we're back over to open sound meter, uh, we can look here, look at another measurement, and uh, these were the very front of the audience and very back of the audience on this particular rig that was tuning. And what I was going for was aligning everything to this yellow part right here. So this is a target trace that is uh, 3dB wide around the point that I, I want to start the system sounding at. So as you can see, it's not flat. You'll hear this a thousand times all over the internet that you should not have a flat system. So it is not flat below 1K. Above that point, I want it to stay as close to the center point, but from 1K down to 100 Hertz, which is easy to remember. So I call it the 911 rule. It is a 9 dB increase from 100 Hertz to 1K, so 911. And in open sound meter, hit command T to turn it on and off, super handy. Uh, you can also import these into Smart or Sat Live or whatever else you use. But this is what I usually start my systems aligning at right here and then go and listen. Uh, oftentimes, uh, I'll see engineers who will tune and EQ the system, get it to this, uh, and then stop. They say, okay, if it's going to be there, I can trust that it sounds good. But this is when you should introduce reference tracks and go out and listen. Um, most engineers... Uh, I found, I, I, that sounds derogatory, I'm sorry. I have seen engineers that have played reference tracks first thing. They haven't aligned the rig, they haven't got levels thing to say, okay, how's it sounding? Everyone is very antsy to get to, to play something and, and, and show people how, how good it sounds. They do reference tracks first and then work backwards and start to EQ it based off the reference track. But I would say you need to make sure you got the right speaker, put in the right place, aimed at the right place, and then EQ to match a target curve that you trust, then play a reference track and listen to see if it's if it's sounding good to you or not. You can use your intuition for that room uh, because you cannot design with the acoustics first because oftentimes we're touring or have shows that pop up in different rooms. Most of them are not ideal. So this target curve is a great place to start. But if I, I did a show last month that I we were in this giant cavernous great hall and with no sound was orchestra, whatever. It was wood, steel, and glass. And that was it. And it was it was spoken word or dialogue the whole time. There was walk-in music, but otherwise people were on laws or handheld 58s. And, and given that, the human voice does not have to be a movie trailer all the time, okay? And so it needs to be clear and intelligible, especially in that echoey environment. So we do not need a lot of this super low end help, all right? So having this big tilt in the low end wasn't helpful. I actually had it completely flat and it turned out to be the best for that show. And so we can look here that this is a K-12 uh, taken from Tracebook, which is a fantastic resource you should check out. Tracebook, I think there's a dash in the middle dot org, but it's an open source library. I have a ton of different measurements taken from engineers out in the field, different speakers. This is the K-12 V1 as a speaker had on this show. And it is razor flat <laughs> for the most part, okay? And so I was able to put this out. But in the field, because of all the reverberation, I had a big boost in the low end because of the off-axis response and reflecting off the walls and a myriad of other um, influences. But I was actually used a low shelf at 1K and below and actually brought it down, I think, 5 or 6 dB because that's what felt right for the room. So if I just blindly aligned to this target curve, raised it, I'd be 12 dB off from where I was. So I could start here, but hearing someone talking to a 58, hearing on my headphones sounding fine, a uh, plenty of low end, uh, and out in the room, it was just overwhelmingly boomly. So having intelligibility ahead of tonality in this case was the right move. So a target curve is useful for uh, getting your system off to the right start, but depending on the room you're in, you may need to adjust it as necessary. Okay, lastly, number seven, 
is how not to tune a sound system is expecting EQ to solve all your problems. I mentioned at the top here that EQ is actually your least powerful tool. And what I mean by that, that yes, it can obviously change how your system sounds, but is least powerful because it comes last in the priority of operations. You're selecting the right speaker, putting in the right place, aiming it at the right place, time aligning it to the rest, and then EQing it to make sure the total balance is right. We want to rush to hear how the system sounds, use EQ according to reference track, and neglect all these other things. And so it is harder to learn physics and trigonometry trigonometry and learn the math behind where what speakers you should choose and why you should put them in a specific place. And that's why I made the audio math survival spreadsheet is to help me understand that. And I hope it can do the same for you. But we need to start with those principles in mind and then save EQ for last. EQ is best to use to make sure the system as a whole has a tonal uniformity to it. So if our mains are made by L Acoustics and they forgot to put front fills on the track, we just have to grab some K-12s from a local shop. We can use EQ to make sure our tonal balance is right. Of course, phase response, uh, which we're not going to dive in today, could be different. So we have to account for that. Can EQ fix that? Can we use filtering? So as you can tell, this gets complex really quickly. But I like to use EQ to make sure all the different zones, no matter what speaking manufacturer, are aligned. So that way I can walk anywhere around in the audience and it sounds good and more or less the same. Again, I would rather sound it sound good than the same. Uh, and as we go back in the audience, we want to make sure it doesn't sound like we're in the front row. That sounds weird for us to look and see that we're far away, but something to sound like we're right in front of our face. And that's part of tonal balancing and your own skill as a system designer and optimizer. But all that being said, EQ is great for sol solving tonal balance problem. It is not good for sound for solving timing problems. So that's why timing precedes EQ. Sometimes we see a cone filter, or these big ripples in our frequency response, we start to EQ them out. Those are more often due to a timing issue, two speakers uh, with the same source coming into the same point in space at different times. You're gonna get a cone filter. Uh, that's another way to calculate something in my audio mass survival spreadsheet. You can take a look at that. But EQ is good for making tonal balance among aligned synchronous units. So let's now recap and look at the inverse of these seven things of what not to do. Let's talk about what you should do and give brief examples of what that might look like. So I would say you need to use a sound system design plan, have a plan, and then have a tuning roadmap. So in here on the left, I've got a PDF of the system report I generated for a recent show I did uh, for commencement uh, in Bud Walton Arena at the University of Arkansas. So this, told, this tells me what speakers I have, the the relative positions of them. If I need to talk to rigging about where the motors go, excuse me, the vertical down tilt angle. Uh, and I was actually able to check that in the field with my inclinometer and realize that even though this plan told me I would have negative 13, I only had negative 11. So I actually had to change the plan because this wasn't accurate. Uh, this is not a knock on ease or RCF. It just didn't translate. How the weight of the rig, again, if, if rigging needs to know that, the number of boxes, the pinpoint, the angles, how far it is above ground, you get the picture. Being able to have all of this in one handy PDF made sure I can make decisions quickly in the field, communicate information quickly, and it was super helpful. And then also when I'm deploying the array to know what angles you need to have between the box. So when you're planning for a show, having all this at your fingertips is great. And then secondly, I had this in a software called Obsidian. That's just a just plain markdown and uh, is locally in the audio computer that has a PA setup. Uh, so what I needed to gather, uh, all of some of this information from the PDF here, uh, what I had to change. So if I could look at it next time, where I needed to place my uh, DL32, which was my stage box, what power, uh, all the IO I needed to get. So it was basically just a big giant checklist of stuff that I had ready because uh, we had a, a not a super short amount of time to set up, but there were a lot of other factors at play. They had to set the stage up by a certain time, which means we needed to have the rig in the air by a certain time. So people uh, just assume people are waiting on you. <laughs> and so this was set up. And then for optimization, uh, this is all the prep of how to get everything into the, the big main system in the arena, then my floor system, how to set up my system tuning rig, uh, the mains, so how to tune the mains. I had two microphones, where I'm going to place it. So I'm not having to step back and think, okay, where am I going to do this? I, I just say, hey, put this microphone here, put this microphone here, capture these traces, EQ, move on, all right? And so it helped me move quickly uh, through all these things because this was a lot of things to do and keeping this all in my brain would, would not be fun. So 
Number two is develop an anti-fragile mindset. So this is the inverse to having too much planning. So to you, some people, this may seem like too much planning. Uh, I get that, but uh, it really didn't take that long to put this all together, especially if you're working from templates or have a proven workflow. So make sure you're not spending too much time getting stuff down to the 10th of a degree um, and and make sure you can move quickly and use the principles in the field to make a great rig. Number three is play a meaningful reference track. If you can, a whole playlist of eight or 10 of them at a meaningful level after you've done your homework and aligned the rig. So this should not be the first thing you hear. You should verify, play pink noise through your boxes and make sure you got everything and there's no weird polarity issues and everything works. But a reference track or music comes after you have selected, place, aimed, or selected, place, verified, aimed, and um, aligned everything in your rig. Another thing I like to do is just have someone talk on a 58 after I hear some music just to see what that's got to sound like. I know what a human voice through 58 sounds like. And if something's really off there, then I know to go check my paperwork or assess and see if something's wrong. Number four is use a two-channel RTA for tuning, not just Jimmy rig a uh, measurement microphone into a DAW like I did and use span and, and look at that. So uh, two-channel RTA gives you infinitely uh, a much bigger amount of data and helpful actual steps than just relying on a single-channel RTA uh, for what's going on. And I'm saying that a two-channel RTA, a two-channel analyzer, an RTA uh, is usually a single-channel thing. Uh, I'm sorry if I discompobulated that. You can fact check me. Number five is listen and optimize for more than just the mix position. So this means having a plan uh, and and optimizing each of the speakers in their coverage zones first, aligning everything, then seeing how front of house fits into the equation. Because front of house doesn't always uh, get placed where you want it to be. And even if it's in a great spot, um, you have to make sure the rest of the audience is going to hear uh, meaningfully what you're doing in front of house. Number six is listen after aligning to your target curve. Don't just align it there and stop. And so that's when reference tracks come into play and listening to the tonality and intelligibility of your system. Number seven, use EQ to solve tonal balance problems, not timing problems. So this is a classic case of uh, a version of the serenity prayer in the 12-step program is, is, is having the wisdom to know the difference between what you can change and you cannot change. You cannot change a floor bounce unless you're going to put sound damping on the floor. So if you have a comb filter, you can say like, hey, where's the reflections at? Is there something weird in the line? Is something getting doubled? If it's not, it's probably something like that that you cannot change. You cannot use EQ to solve the comb filter in a floor bounce, for example. Okay, so that, that was a whole lot of information. Thanks for sticking around. I would love for you to let me know below which of these mistakes have you made or are currently making in the field? Which of these seven? And, and so don't forget to get my free resource, the Audio Mass Survival Spreadsheet. I've got a link below. It's got a ton of great calculations for you. I'm Michael. So thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you on the next one.